Zoom recording. Oh, there you go. Let's send them more. There we go. Good. So I can show you a copy when we've done today. Brilliant. So uh, every Wednesday, 45 minutes, you know all this. Why collective wisdom, different perspectives, collaboration, new ideas, insights on how to go about winning work, which is something I guess we're all interested in. Um, why do I mean independent executive? Because I'm not interested in whether we call ourselves a consultant, interim, freelancer, contractor, whatever it is. We are there to help clients help solve problems. And that might mean identifying the problem uh, right at the top there. It might mean once they've identified it, helping them analyze why it's a problem and what's causing it and what's causing it to be stuck. It might involve designing a solution to address the challenges. It might involve implementing and it might involve um, embedding, maintaining and improving. So our job is rather than say, what box do I want to be put in? It's where is the client and do I want to help them uh, in their endeavors? So the answers to the question, why do projects fizzle out? Um, I guess this is where I thought it was going to be higher. So poor business case, they eventually fizzle out because nobody can really justify them. Um, I think that's, I, I do think that's true. I think that's probably true more in implementation. Um, but equally, it could be true as part of that. Change in priorities, yeah, stuff happens. And what was important one minute is no longer important. Another is not really that much we can do about that. Another was more about these, when people commented on it, it was more about poor business case and lack of ownership. So, so taking that as the, as the basis, and we say those, those factors are pretty critical in whether or not a project goes forward or not. If I look at the, the pre-purchase, i.e., I'm trying to decide whether or not to go ahead rather than I've gone ahead and it's fizzling out from a client's perspective. So let me start by asking you a question. And that question is, what, when you look back over the years, tell me what your best decisions were. Tell me one of your best decisions. Give me a, give me a, um, answer the question <laughs> answer the question give me a decision that you think was a great decision that you made it could have been a, a betting on a horse it could have been taking a job it could have been um getting married it could have been whatever but, but tell me tell me about a decision you've made that you think was a great decision yeah john installing a wood burning stove 11 years ago why well, because it heats the other, like your like your house. So this one's quite old. And, yeah, uh, it's uh, very badly insulated. Blah 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 blah. We all know about climate change and all the government yeah. imperatives. Uh, yeah. But when the gas goes out and the light goes out, it's still keep warm. <laughs> okay, good. Is that why you bought it? Because you thought the gas and the lights might go out? No, no, no. Because it was we have an ingle nook and uh, just an open fire when we bought it. Yeah, we thought this would look good, and of course, it's been the best thing we ever did. Okay, so it's looks. The rest of the house is falling down, by the way. But uh... <laughs> you'll keep warm. Well, that's what we used to do anyway. Just sit around a campfire, gnawing deer legs. So, um, who else? Good one. Cheers, John. What else? Another one. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna move on until you tell me a good decision you made. Um, I mean, I suppose from my perspective, in terms of kind of a good decision, um, I was actually relocating back to London. So. We'd lived in, myself and Anne, we'd lived in London for 10 or so years. We took it upon ourselves to move out to Kent because we thought we'd done with the London thing. Yeah. And that coincided when I decided to go self-employed and then found myself four and a half, for four and a half years commuting back into London pretty much every day. So that yeah. was the plan. And just that kind of um, ease of access in terms of being around people, being available, um, spontaneity, particularly when I was looking to sort of diversify a bit more in terms of work. Okay. Um, just that ability, that's less of an issue now with Zoom, but you know, Zoom wasn't really a thing six years ago. Um, good stuff. Moving back. Okay, that's good. So, um, so the point of asking the question is, <clears throat> do, we, do we judge a decision as good or bad based on the outcome it brought? Uh, 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 and when I ask that question, probably 90% of people who respond will tell me why the decision ended up being a good decision. It's a bit like saying, I, I bet on uh, the thousand to one outsider in the, gra in the Grand National and it came in. Uh, therefore, it was a good decision. Yeah. And 
and and in reality it was not a good decision but the outcome was uh, and that's directly relevant to the conversation we're talking about we're, we're having today which is I, I if I judge a decision by the outcome and the outcome is purely lucky it will affect potentially all decisions I make in the future so there are two factors at play here one is did I make the right decision the other is somewhat separate and largely irrelevant is what was the outcome so, so the, the, there's a great book by a woman who, pl who plays poker, you know, a world champion poker player, talks about playing poker and the number of decisions you have to make in a poker game. When she got together with a mastermind group, the first time it was a brother's group because he was also a world champion. When she got together in the mastermind group, they, uh, they invited her along to observe and, uh, and one of the guys started by saying, okay, this is the situation I would like to know what you would have done uh, 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 and he explained that he was playing in a tournament and it was in Las Vegas uh, Las Vegas and he's and then the group started asking him questions so what time of day was it had you eaten had anybody been drinking what run were you on what run was everybody else on what was the lighting like what was the weather like they asked hundreds and hundreds of questions and at the end of it they each, they each said in turn whether or not they would have played the hand and uh and then she piped up with, so what happened then? Did you win? And they all looked, to her, looked at her and said, I don't understand the relevance of that question. Yeah, it, it's the decision and the quality of the decision that matters. The outcome is open to chance. Yeah, it, if, if a horse is a thousand to one, then one in every thousand, it'll come in. It doesn't mean that if you happen to bet on it that. So when we look at projects that we're working on, um, uh, uh, and when I used to manage salespeople, you would get very enthusiastic salespeople who would be convinced that they could win a deal against all the odds. You would ask loads of questions of them like, who's the incumbent? How well is the incumbent embedded? Uh, what's the budget of the client? What's the commitment of the client? What's the urgency for the client? Um, what is the quality of our solution compared to our competitors? What is your relationship like with the key decision makers? What's your relationship like with other people who aren't key decision makers but are likely to influence? How well do you understand their decision making process? Have you been involved in any of these? And so on and so on and so on. And even though the answer to all those questions might be uh, not particularly favourable, the salesman would be convinced he could win it and at the end of it you know very very rarely they might win it and from then on their decision making would be undermined they didn't ask the right question so it's an interesting um it's interesting when we're looking at clients is <clears throat> do we really think we can win this or are we being overly optimistic <clears throat> and going again back 30 odd years, competing against at the time Anderson Consulting, when I was winning or my team were winning roughly one in four bids that we that we went for, costing us upwards of £200,000 each to bid. Um, I went to see Anderson Consulting um, and said, can you do me a favour and tell me how you win nine out of ten bids? And they said... Uh, the guy said to me, we only bid on those we're going to win. Now, what a great comment and what an obvious comment. Uh, and, and how brilliant was it to receive that wisdom as a naive um, sales manager, effectively. So, but what does that mean in practical terms? Well, we've all got our funnels, whether we, whether we draw them or not. <clears throat> and our funnel consists of... Who do we think we're trying to win business from? What sort of companies? What sort of people? What sort of challenges? <clears throat> we create awareness in that target market and a small percentage of them then become what we used to call suspects, which is they've shown a vague degree of interest. A naive salesperson would say, I've got a 90% chance of winning that. 80% chance, 70% chance, but a ridiculously high one. I would say we've got a what? five percent or two percent chance of winning that you know i'm i'm my 90 percent comes here my hundred percent comes when they sign the contract so 
how do those suspects become prospects? Now, this is the interesting bit because this is where the real work starts. This is where we're going to invest a lot of effort. In, a, in the terms I was talking about, that was £200,000 per bid. That's a lot of money to spend on stuff that we haven't got a chance of winning. Yeah? We've got to make a lot of profit to recover that. So this is the bit where we really want to be making up our mind whether or not we're going to put the effort in to win the deal. It's going to take up a lot of our time. And the sooner we say no, we're pulling out, the better. So no... I'm not going to bid is a great answer for an awful lot of projects. It's just that people don't say no enough. I think one of the reasons is nobody wants to see an empty funnel. And therefore, we sometimes tend to be a bit over optimistic or, to put it bluntly, lie to ourselves that there's stuff in the funnel which really shouldn't be. So be honest with ourselves is one. So the, 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 the last thing I really want to point, want to go through is that this is um, something I used uh, uh, two or three years ago with a, uh, a client who, who was involved in extremely complex infrastructure change sales. Um, I, I, and the VC who was involved in that organization, uh, the partner who'd left, who'd, uh, had left, who'd invested and the new VCs didn't understand complex sales. And it was the chairman who said, could I, get involved uh, 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 and the, the 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 vcs ex mckins is really 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 smart people um but had never worked in a complex sales environment so, so so i use this to try and get the message over i think what we sell is a complex sale as individuals i think it's a complex sale um and one of the things even though their deals are uh, are roughly 50 million dollars per deal and they only probably win a couple a year um they are very complex but what i'm not saying is a deal has to be big to be complex i'm saying what we do is complex how do i define complexity i define complexity with has the client done a lot of this before and is it um how critical is it to get the right answer so uh, so so a lot of organizations and what the vc was trying to do is look at clients as if they were purchasing so they saw clients as purchasing decisions traditionally they'd worked on small deals but hundreds of them we're talking about a few deals but very high value. So the client, so they would look at clients' job as purchasing. They didn't see that it was a two a, a two stage process. So when we look at our clients, we've got two stages. Stage one is, from a client's perspective, is am I going to make a decision? Stage two is, what decision am I going to make? Am I going to go forward? Stage one is, do I need to change something about the way I operate? Is there something in my organization that needs changing and does it need changing right now? In other words, have I got a very critical threat or opportunity that I'm facing that I must do something about and I must do something about it now? If the answers to those two questions is no, then it's quite likely the project's going to drag on. And then the next stage is, OK, if I need to change something, what specifically do I need to change? then do I need help? And if I do, what sort of help do I need? How, what, how much help do I want and how much am I willing to pay for it? So, so, so the research that I've seen, which is, a, which is generic research across multiple projects in IT, but I actually think is incredibly, um, I think is accurate across many, including people like us, which is if we're involved in this upfront part, we've got a three out of four chance of winning. If we get involved at this stage, then we have a much lower chance of winning. And I'm assuming a level playing field. Clearly, if we're coming in via an interim provider or an agency, and there are four of us up for it, and clearly we're incredibly well qualified, better than the others, uh, then you could probably bump that figure up. But it is dependent on who else is put forward and who's available and whether or not we can uh, come across well in a, in, in a meeting. But if we're involved in this stage, 
we do we 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 have a much better chance of singing uh, of succeeding. So looking at it this way, if a client doesn't buy anything, in other words, the project or opportunity fizzles out, then in my view, it's because that bit was done badly. Now, if a client's not done it before or hasn't got the expertise to do it before, then it is not surprising it gets done badly. If it's simply handed over to purchasing and, and, and a purchasing process is used, the chances are the great solution isn't going to come forward. If a great solution doesn't come forward, we can't get a decent ROI and it, it fizzles out. So, um, so they either buy nothing. If, you, if you're involved and help them, then there's a very good chance they buy you. And if, and if you don't win it, there's a very good chance somebody else bought it. So this was the, uh, you know, although not in these terms, this was what I was trying to do with salespeople 30 years ago in the technology sector. This is what I try and do with my own clients now. And this is what I see uh, successful into, uh, interims doing with, with their clients. They don't bother bidding a lot of the times if they're getting in this stage. They are really clear about... Is there an ROI? Is there a person accountable for it? Is that person who's accountable for it motivated and committed to driving it through to the end conclusion? I'll give you a last example and then I'll shut up. I, I took a project on about two weeks ago uh, and, and the client who I know um, from years and years and years ago, I haven't seen for probably eight years, but he rang me up and asked me if I wanted to get involved. I said, I'd love to get involved, but but in order to, um, before I get involved, these are the things you and the management need to do in order to prepare the project so I can take it over. Uh, and it was quite a lot of work for them. Uh, they went away and did it, you know, and I set some deadlines. They went away and did it, came back and said, right, that's all ready. Are you, are you ready? Uh, at which point I'm totally willing to commit. I don't know if you've faced it, but I, I, I get quite a few people saying, can you send me a proposal? Uh, and I, uh, I and I invariably refuse because usually it's far too early. It's a very, very good way of somebody getting some ideas to say, send me a proposal. But sending a proposal, if we're going to do it right, is, 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 I think, a lot of work. That lot of work, I'm only going to put that lot of work in if I think there's a very good chance of the project going forward. End of story. Oh, shut up. Comments. Examples. Um, just something to throw in. I um, I had a call. So I had an email a couple of weeks ago from somebody I've not seen for three years. They're a student at one of the business schools, a teacher, hmm. uh, asking me to have a conversation with them around a challenge that he faced, um, which I was happy to do. Yeah. And, and during that, I found myself falling into the trap of, and I'll send you some information. <laughs> um, and, and, and it was just... It was kind of unintentional, but suddenly found myself, don't worry, by the middle of next week, I'll send you some thoughts and ideas and we can, we can look at how we can progress this. Yeah. And I'm sat here now going, oh God, I've got to do something. Um, <laughs> and, you and, want it, to, and you want it to be good, right? You don't yeah, want yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is work. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's, uh, to put in context, they're a um, investment fund that at the moment they've got 30 million under management. They're going to end up with 300 million at the end of this year. Mm. They're going to be 3 billion by the end of 2024. Mm. So the, they're, they're too important to go doesn't matter yeah um but in the same breath i'm like oh fiddlesticks i need to do this now yeah um and it's a bit of a tricky one at times because it is that whole you know it's it's that whole would like to push back would like to say no you know take it on trust or otherwise but it's in the same breath i think some people are just so used to receiving that proposal presentation or otherwise yeah it's a, it's a natural course it's sort of it's in a quite an easy way of killing the conversation isn't it go that sounds really interesting can you send me a proposal Hmm. yeah the silly thing was i was the one that did it not him yeah <laughs> but it's better game with this client i had the conversation with them and i do it uh, or i used to do it i'd say brilliant okay and i think they were committed and i go right i'm gonna do this and i'll get it to you on i'll get it to you first thing monday morning and i'd work over the weekend deliver it first thing monday morning and then i'd, I'd contact them maybe tuesday and say you know uh, any feedback and they'd go not read it yet and i'd think and then I suddenly realised it was me. You know, I treat everything as urgent. Yeah. Yeah. And you want it, you want it. Therefore, you must want it quick. What a, what a naive thing to do, eh? <laughs> Great stuff, Lincoln. What else? Simon, I'm struggling to, um, <clears throat> I'm struggling to, to, 
to fit this together, how you can kind of do nothing until that decision gets made. Um, but right at the start, you ask the question, why change? Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody is at that very nebulous, um, unclear, lots of potential opportunities or directions which a decision might go, yeah. how you how they know to contact you or how they know that you're going to add value at that stage yeah to to if they find a route um through that that actually doesn't involve you how how do you you don't yeah. know that they, it's not going to involve you until you find out it doesn't it's right gift. yeah no I, so so you think at the moment that you'll get involved is the moment they're saying here's the deal do you want to do you want to do it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Comments on that. How do you get involved up front when they don't know they need you up front? I must admit, you know, that classic, if it's in person, it's almost a little bit easier to have that conversation and actually start to walk it through a little bit more. It's more tricky remotely via Zoom, Teams or otherwise, um, in terms of kind of almost putting yourself in their shoes. Um, but I have had it situations where it's almost, you know, you start to sketch stuff out. If it's over a coffee in person in the office or otherwise, you can almost kind of start to start to work on it there and then, mm. um, which has been more tricky over the last 18 months. Okay. You found it more tricky. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But just, just not that partially as well. People seem to, they block their time to such a point. They don't have time. Mm-hmm. So they want to finish Zoom meetings five minutes before the, the hour or otherwise, because then they can pop to the bathroom, get a coffee before the next one starts. Uh-huh. Um, I've only got, in fact, um, you talked about the charities at the start, uh, British Heart Foundation and British Red Cross both have it set where you're not allowed to have a meeting greater than 45 minutes on Zoom mm-hmm. to make sure that everybody has time. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good idea. But mm-hmm. obviously not everybody's doing the same. Mm-hmm. So it's that you don't have that opportunity to just have that free form conversation quite in the same way because people are more regimented or feels like they're more regimented in their mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Anybody else's experience? I agree totally about the idea that uh, we are so restricted online. And another important fact is that we do not see all the visual cues that we would normally have in face-to-face communication. Sometimes the audio is not good or the lighting is not good and we can't really see that that person properly. So it is true, our communication is really restricted. We can't read another person so well. And uh, I agree with you, it is... does hamper my communication most definitely and my opportunities to sell my product. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, well, Simon, I would say, you know, uh, you need to take your chances. You need to take your, you, the proposal thing you talked about, you, know? mm-hmm. you need to take your chances. And until unless you have your track record, uh, you I don't think you have any other option uh, but to send the proposal. It has happened with me as well, you know. Uh, I, I would normally put in a lot of effort preparing that proposal and eventually that would, uh, that would not materialize. Uh, having said that, uh, and uh, you know, based on the experience I, I've had, I would say you still need to take your chances until unless you have a track record to back you up. Okay, so, so, so if you send out more proposals, you, you have a chance of getting more projects. Uh, no, uh, that, that's, that's one thing. That's one thing. And uh, obviously, you may not be required to, uh, they may not be very rigid about your sending the proposal in case you have a track record. Uh, and once you have a track record, probably the chances of winning the bid are more. The chances of your proposal being accepted are more. Un- I mean, so there's no point in, you know, getting disappointed if the proposals are not being accepted. Okay, so so part of me doesn't, uh, part of me agrees with you that, but but proposals are, so I I tend to split proposals into two, 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 two chunks. One is a discussion document, one is a proposal. The proposal is incredibly tiny. It, it effectively says what what I said in the discussion document. This is how much it costs. The discussion document is where I really want the client involved. 
So this may this may be if I think there is a definite need for them to change, mm -hmm. and I think there's some real threats and opportunities, and I might do uh, a, a bit of work with them, or well, I will do a bit of work with them to identify what those threats and opportunities are and which are most critical, and if they really need to change, at which point I will be convinced that they are convinced they need to change and they need to change now. Mm -hmm. and, and then, I'll want a lot of commitment from them in order to make that into a decent discussion document. We sign off the discussion document, then I can produce a proposal. I think, Damien, your point is, but but how do I get involved in the in the in the outset? And this is um, th th this is where I see this is where I see marketing and selling as being separate. Se mm -hmm. Selling is where there is an opportunity, <clears throat> they want to buy something and they want to decide who they're going to buy from. Marketing is about creating awareness that you exist. Now, we talked a little bit before about personal branding and uh, uh, and whilst I think it's a subject which is enormously overcomplicated, um, if, if we were to take the, the Bezos one, which is what three words would people use about me if I wasn't there? then um, then we can we can either get into the minutiae of what we do. In other words, our brand is I am a specialist in helping these sorts of companies fix these sorts of problems. But ultimately, the, the three words I would want more than anything are uh, approachable, helpful and uh, caring, something like that. It, it, so what, what I want to, to create and this is what this is what I think you're doing, Damien, is you are creating for the future. You are creating relationships where you become the first port of call. Yeah, it's not the first port of call to say, uh, Damien, I've rung you up because I've got this project. I think you'll be suitable for it. It's Damien, I've rung you up because I'm a bit stuck <laughs> and I could do with a sounding board. So we're, we're positioning ourselves not as somebody who can solve their problems. We're positioning ourselves as somebody who they ought to talk to when they get a bit stuck. If we can do that, we are right in at the beginning. If we're right in at the beginning, we can either go, uh, well, we can certainly help just by being a sounding board. We may then say, you know what, this is, I, I, I know somebody who would, be, who would be really helpful to you on this one. Or, hang on a minute, I've got some good idea. I've got some ideas on this. Um, what we really need to do is you give me access to X, Y, and Z and these people and these people, let them know that I'm working on this project and, I, and I'll do, I'll spend a couple of days meeting people and then I'll come back to you with some ideas. When I come back to you, I will either expect it to become a project or I expect to point in the direction of someone else. <clears throat> but, but in that form of um, creation, that's the, that's the long-term goal of your marketing, is to create an environment where people want to get in touch with you. So, you know, for one of my big clients was a guy has been, a, he was my first client ever, and he's still a client now, but he's moved around from Amdal to Fujitsu to a bunch of places. And he told me that a few years ago, he said, uh, when we were having lunch, he said, um, he said, I want to, I, I want to have lunch because I want to talk something through with you. Uh, and, and he said, his words to me were, uh, the reason I love talking through stuff with you is because you never try and sell me anything. You, you, you know, all you do is you just sit there, listen, ask some questions, and then point me in a direction where I might, where I might want to go. Uh, I, a lot of the times there's no project in it for me, but, but it doesn't half build that brand. Now he tells other people, uh, and from that one guy, I've probably won, I don't know, seven projects from completely different people. So I've, I've done about six for him and about seven for people he's referred me to. Simply, and all he, I think all he ever says is, and I think I might have mentioned this with Specsavers, all he ever says is, have a chat with this guy. He often helps me get clarity. End of story. That's, all he ever, that's his introduction. Not, here's a guy who can help you solve the problem. Just here's a guy that you might want to talk it through with. I think that's where we're trying to get to. Mm. Yeah, but but coming back to Akshay's point, but in the meantime, <laughs> let's send a load of proposals as well. <laughs> yeah, because be, be, yeah, yeah. because we can still win business. Yeah, it's just that if we want to get to the stage where we only go for business, we're going to win. We want to be at the stage of being in at the start. 
in order to get to that stage, we need to do our marketing and presenting ourselves and meeting people and having coffees and chats and whatever it may be. We want to do that so that you know we get lucky. Of course, we get lucky. They turn around and go, I've got something that's right up your street. But we're doing that as a long term branding exercise rather than a short term winning business. The business will come if it's there. On the, on the Zoom call thing, I, I, I've, I've got mixed views on that one. I must say I've, I've found myself I found it a lot easier to get a 15 minute slot, you know, just to say, uh, we haven't spoken for ages, just want to catch up. I noticed something in the press about you or I, or I noticed something on LinkedIn about you or I noticed some, do you want to have a quick 15 minute catch up? And I've found most people go, yeah, be brilliant. I'd love to. If it's face to face, out of politeness, we tend to allocate an hour. Yeah. And we have to make coffees and do all that nonsense. Uh, 15 minutes seems to be all right on Zoom. And, I, and, and I've found, generally speaking, although there is a little bit of chit chat at the beginning, actually, we get down to business really quickly. So, mm -hmm. uh, so strangely, I've found almost the opposite in a lot of cases that 15 minutes is, which is all ultimately we need to catch up and ask a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Great. If the questions we ask are illuminating for them, they will say, look, can we have, can we, can we put, set aside some time? Yeah, but that fifteen minutes seems to be enough, and 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 in and I've mentioned this before. The Clifford Chance guy, who I always thought was immensely posh, the first Zoom call I had with him, he was in a camouflage hoodie, uh, and and whilst not necessarily with him because we got on very well anyway, with some people I've found the barriers break down dramatically just because I'm in their house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the point on Zoom in some respects is that often I do end up with meetings that are scheduled longer than just a 15 in terms of catch up. Mm. And then when we get into the nitty gritty, we're, you know, we want to continue the conversation, but we're just not able to. No, no. So but if it's an important conversation to have, we will set aside time. So I'm saying yeah. we in 15 minutes, we should be able to establish if we want to talk for an hour. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 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 and it may be that we don't. We just go brilliant to catch up. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have a beer next time, you know, maybe we'll be able to have a bit, whatever, whatever, whatever. But in 15 minutes, we can very quickly decide if we want to set aside another hour. Whereas if you're having a coffee and a catch up in somebody's office, then it sort of is. It's very rarely 15 minutes just because of the faffing around. Just a, a quick thing on that, just to throw in as an idea. Um, so uh, during the pandemic, I was introduced to a platform called Lunch Club. I don't know if anybody else uses Lunch Club or has come across it at all. Mm. Um, it's um, a really simple thing. So it's, it's a piece of AI that allows you to, so you build a, so invitation only, once you join, you build a profile, you talk about what you're interested in and what, and talk about who's the type of person you like to meet. Um, and then you set aside some time each week and you can, you can agree a time. And then the platform matches that time with somebody who matches who you're interested in and vice versa. Um, sets, they then, the whole thing's hosted through their own uh, Zoom equivalent platform. Mm. I've yet to have a meeting that hasn't proved fruitful. Mm. Um, and it's always been with people I have no relationship whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite a clever piece of tech. And just one of the things I found useful with that is it, particularly when, when I was starting to build Red Dog ads, it was really useful to meet really random people, but to have a purpose in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, because it was helpful for kind of pitching, getting the message down. Mm. And just that whole... I kind of almost would liken it to a, a serendipity water cooler moment mm. where you get that random conversation with somebody that you used to have in the office. It kind mm. of offers something similar. Mm. So, um, just a thought of something a bit different. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that, that sort of those, some of those network events had that speed dating type thing to it. And all you'd end up doing is going, yeah, I want to meet you for longer. And no, I don't want to. Yeah. But it was all quite, um, it's good, but it was a pleasant experience as well for some. Not everybody enjoys that sort of stuff. Any other comments? Nine forty-three. Good. Thanks for that. Good. Okay. So, um, uh, so yeah, good. Uh, if I, I'll hang around a bit longer, um, um, but if you want to, if you want to call it a day, feel free to disappear. Um, usual stuff. If you want to do a uh a one-to-one -one strategy thing about how this might apply to you then feel free to book on the website it's got a little thing that says strategy session you click on it go to calendly and then off we pop um otherwise um and if you can think of a topic that you particularly want to focus in on in subsequent weeks let me know 
otherwise it's 9 45 i'm not late like i was last time so i shall call it a day here take no more of your time um unless you want to hang on the call great to speak to you yep great thank Everyone. you simon thank you very much